In the second video for finding subjects and verbs, what I want to focus in on is prepositional phrases and helping verbs, and this idea that there can be more than one subject and verb in a sentence. So first I want to start with a definition, and it's a definition of the word clause. A clause is going to be any group of words that's going to contain at least one subject and one verb, but it can also contain multiple subjects and or multiple verbs. Um, so keep in mind when we're looking for the subjects, we're looking for the actor in the sentence, and we're looking for verbs, we're looking for the actions performed by those actors. The thing that I want to kind of point out here is that um, a clause, again, is a section of a sentence, or it could be a whole sentence itself. So a clause means it's got a subject and verb, but one sentence could have multiple clauses within it. Uh, so there could be more than one subject and verb in a sentence. There could be more than one subject and verb in a clause. Let me give you a few examples of this. So in this first sentence, Amanda and Nancy went to Idaho on purpose. At the start of the sentence, um, we've got Amanda and Nancy, and then we've got them going to Idaho on purpose. So again, I'm saying that I want you to find your verbs first. So let's go ahead and start with the verb itself. So in this sentence, our verb is going to be went. And then I ask myself who or what went to Idaho, and that'll give me Amanda and Nancy as my subjects. You'll notice that there's only one clause here because there's only one subject verb sequence. It's a sentence because it has a complete thought. On this next sentence, when the rodeo is in town, Jason, Bill, and Sharon see the horses, buy cotton candy, and usually get arrested for mischief. Again, I kind of have two parts in this one. So I've got this first part at the beginning where I've got when the rodeo is in town. And at that part there, when the rodeo is in town, I want to be looking for a subject and verb in that section by itself. And then in the second part of the sentence, I've got this second part here that's got Jason, Bill, and Sharon see the horses, buy cotton candy, and usually get arrested for mischief. So I'm going to look for subjects and verbs there as well. So in the first part of my sentence, my action is going to be is and what is in town? It's the rodeo. So the action there is this linking verb, this state of being verb is. In the second part of the sentence, Jason, Bill, and Sharon, they are seeing, so that's a verb. They are buying, that's a verb. And they are getting. And then arrested is what they are getting. Um, and so my subjects then, I move back from C to say who's seeing the horses? Well, it's going to be all three of these people, Jason, Bill, Sharon. Uh, who's buying the cotton candy? Again, it's still Jason, Bill, and Sharon. And then who's getting arrested? Again, still Jason, Bill, and Sharon. So they're doing all three of those actions. Here I've got one more sentence. Uh, Randy and Eddie are friends and they like mu movies. Again, I've got the first part stops at friends, but then I have the second part where I'm saying that they like movies. And so in the first part, my verb is going to be are. And my subject, who are friends? Randy and Eddie. In the second part, I've got they like movies. So like is my verb. Who likes the movies? They do. That'll be my subject. Now, within a clause, you can have groups of words that go together that are not um, that are not containing a subject and verb. And we call those groups of words that go together but don't have a subject and verb. We call those phrases. So any group of words that goes together to kind of form a, its own little cohesive unit but they do not contain a subject and verb are going to be phrases. So a prepositional phrase is going to be a phrase, group of words that goes together without subject and verb, but that starts with a preposition. Um, and prepositions in sentences, prepositional phrases, what they do is they describe direction and they describe location in sentences. So here, let's look at uh, this uh, example. So I've got, I went to the store. So you'll see that at the end of the sentence, to the store, it all goes together, but it doesn't have a subject and verb. It shows you the direction that I went, 
So this would be a prepositional phrase. The first part of that phrase is going to be that word to. And so to is the preposition itself. And then the phrase is going to be to the store. The whole thing is to the store. Uh, John was sitting on the sofa. Again, my, f my preposition itself is the word on. And so the prepositional phrase is the rest of that on the sofa. And one way that you know that you're at the end of a prepositional phrase is that you start with that preposition, the locator word, in, on, over, under. And then you say uh, in, on, over, under, what. And the what is going to be the end of the phrase. So to the store, on the sofa, etc. Prepositions can also be used to locate words along a timeline. So for example, um, we might have words like before, until, during, after, or since. So if those are followed just by a, a noun, just by a, a what, so uh, before sunrise we should go to the movies. So before sunrise would be a, a prepositional phrase. Um, after dinner uh, we should get a dessert. Uh, after dinner would be a prepositional phrase. Um, during the movie uh, Bill was talking loudly. During the movie would be a prepositional phrase. So here's another example then. Before sunset, I want to get in a bike ride. I want to get in a bike ride. Um, I want to be in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Again, those are both prepositional phrases, before sunrise and during Mardi Gras. Maybe the most important kind of preposition uh, are the ones that show relationships of words. Um, so for example, uh, I am talking about the end of the world about the end is going to locate what I'm my what I'm talking about uh, and of the world locates which kind of end I'm talking about uh, the most important maybe preposition for what we're going to be using them for is probably the word of and of locates meaning um, so in in that sentence right uh, I'm talking about the end of the world, uh, what I'm doing is I'm locating the meaning of the word end by saying it's which kind of end. Uh, it's the end of the world. Uh, you are as cool as a cucumber, uh, so I'm telling you how cool you are. Between you and me, I like to play video games. I have now located this idea of liking to play video games between you and me. Uh, notice that the verb here is really just still liking to play those video games. So why do we want to learn this? Uh, essentially the main reason why I'm teaching you guys prepositional phrases is because anything that's in a prepositional phrase will not be your subject. So if I have a sentence like this following one, one of the students bought a hamburger and I know that my verb is going to be bought, I then ask myself who or what bought a hamburger and I think you're tempted to want to mark students, but students is part of this prepositional phrase of the students and so it becomes clear then that my subject is really going to be one it's really only one of these students that's my subject only one of them who bought the hamburger so um, watch out for prepositional phrases a little bit as we're as we're trying to find our subjects and verbs and sentences um, and again the main prepositional phrase to kind of watch out for is going to be the preposition of and the phrases that then go with that preposition so let's talk about helping verbs. Helping verbs are verbs, um, and so they should be marked as verbs. Uh, this is when you have multiple, um, you know, kind of verbs in a sequence, and they are verbs because they actually change the meaning of the action itself. So, for example, if I just have a simple verb like eat, I eat the sandwich. In this sentence, eating is happening. Um, I eat it maybe on a regular basis, something along those lines. Once I start adding helping verbs, if I add the word might on this, I might eat the sandwich. Now my eating of that sandwich is now somehow in doubt. It, it may happen, it may not happen, um, but it's not absolutely clear that it's going to happen. If I say I can eat the sandwich, what's happening now is that now I have that ability to eat the sandwich. It's a sandwich that I have the physical ability. Maybe it's a big sandwich, but I really can eat it. 
Helping verbs are also ones that are going to tell us whether an action's occurred uh, in the future, perhaps. So, for example, um, Reginald is telling tells us that it's happening right now. But if I say Reginald has told, uh, the action happens in the past. And if I say Reginald will tell, now the action is happening in the future. So notice that the addition of the helping verb with the t versions of tell I have here actually changes the action itself. It's no longer um, exactly the same action because it's happening at different times. Keep in mind that you can have more than one helping verb in a row. So for example, I might have been considering that idea. Considering is my main action, but might, have, been are all helping verbs. In the second part of this, I will not have had enough time. Uh, having had enough time is the main action here, but will have and had are all verbs here. Questions often have the helping verb at the beginning of the sentence, um, separated by even the subject itself. So, have you been to see the doctor? In that case, I've got uh, been as my main verb, but have as my helping verb. My subject on that sentence would be you. As we get into our later units, you'll see that the helping verb is often maybe the most important one for the changes that happen with things like uh, subject verb agreement. Uh, so it's really important that we, we can identify not just the verbs, but all the helping verbs as well.